you have these negative thoughts, these hateful thoughts, these resentful thoughts, this thinking, thinking, it's going to be hard to heal because it's just, it's going to create inflammation. Your thoughts can create inflammation in your body. That's a fact. Dr. Bruce Lipton has proven that thoughts are a frequency that have the ability to cross your cell membranes and communicate with your DNA to produce proteins. And that, if it's a negative thought, it will produce inflammatory proteins. If it's a positive thought, it will produce anti-inflammatory proteins. The average person thinks 60,000 thoughts every single day. And 90% of those thoughts are the same thoughts from yesterday and the day before and the day before that. And they're usually negative thoughts. So we need to change that pattern. It's called the paradigm. We need to break that paradigm, bust it up, and create a new paradigm, which takes time. It takes 66 days, according to the University of College London, to start forming new behavior patterns in the brain. And uh, uh, that's a big, big uh, thing in the keto space, in the health space in general, because people are not doing the innercising before they're doing the exercising. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Reshape Your Health podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Morgan Nolte, and I've been waiting to interview this guest for a long time. Uh, ben Azadi is here with us today, and he is the best-selling author of KetoFlex. He's also the founder of Keto Camp. And if you don't already listen to his podcast or follow him on YouTube or Instagram, definitely check him out. He puts out a lot of good content. Um, when I was kind of starting my own journey, he was one of the first people I found in this space. So I've been following you for a couple of years. Um, thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise with us today. I'm excited to be here, Morgan. Thank you so much for the invitation. We're going to have some fun. Oh, we are. And we kind of have a lot of different topics that we're going to cover. Um, I asked you, what do you want to cover? And you said, I love talking about innate intelligence. And I'm sure that for a lot of our audience, they're like, what? You know, rewind that. What did she just say? Uh, so go ahead and explain to us, what is this innate intelligence that you love talking about? And why do you love talking about it? Yeah, there, there's a wisdom that sits within our body, within our cells. And it's, it's called the innate intelligence. And what the innate intelligence is, it's the world's greatest healer, the world's greatest physician, there is no pill, surgery, supplement, shot, whatever that could replace the healing powers of this innate intelligence. So I believe in God. I believe God put that power inside of us, but you could replace that word with whatever you feel comfortable with. But every single cell has this intelligence. And if we just allow this intelligence to do what it's designed to do, then we're going to have amazing energy levels. We're going to have uh, peak brain function, body composition is going to be amazing. We're going to be able to live a healthy, long life and feel really damn good the whole time we're living that life. The challenge is that we have interfered with the innate intelligence. So when somebody has a symptom and the list of symptoms, as you know, Morgan could go on for hundreds to thousands of different symptoms from brain fog to fatigue, to acne, to sleep issues, to cancer. Cancer is actually a symptom. Diabetes, insulin resistance, these are all symptoms. They are a result of the problem. What's the problem? The innate intelligence is being blocked. There is interference. So if we could understand that the body is designed to heal and identify what's blocking the healing capabilities, then we're gonna go down the path of looking at the causes instead of chasing the symptoms. So that's why I love the innate intelligence because it's within every single cell of every single human being on this planet. It doesn't matter if you're black, brown, white, tall, short, whatever your circumstances are, whatever you do in life, everybody has this innate intelligence and we could all use it and harness it. Well, I love that, but what's blocking our innate intelligence? I mean, what are the biggest things that you see in your practice? There are a lot of things interfering with the innate intelligence. The, the most common one, of course, it's the food we eat, or, or I, sh I should put food in quotation marks. It's the food that you do that. like substances because human beings are the only species that's actually smart enough to create our own food and we're dumb enough to actually eat it. <laughs> so eating processed foods, it's going to block this innate intelligence. You study and you teach a lot about insulin resistance. If yeah. you're constantly spiking glucose and insulin throughout the day, like you're grazing and eating processed foods, that's going to challenge the system. And every time it's like wearing out the car, you know, wear out the innate intelligence, you're going to wear out the body. So eating frequently, eating high carbs, processed foods, that is blocking the innate intelligence. And even in the keto space, which is where I come from, 
and I know we're going to talk about this, but yeah. eating the wrong fats, eating like uh, these unstable fats, another area that we'll get into blocks the innate intelligence. And then lastly, probably the number one cause that blocks the innate intelligence, I believe, is environmental toxins like heavy metals and mercury, mold, lead, pesticides, herbicides. So there, and there's a long list, but those are probably the top ones that block this amazing innate intelligence. Yeah. So then how do you help people identify, you know, their specific things? Or is it just telling them that and they're like, oh yeah, I do that, I do that, I do that, I do that. And then that's kind of their list on the things to optimize. Is that kind of how it works with your programs and your books and that kind of thing? Yeah, well, with my specifically my Keto Camp Academy, we're yeah. identifying nutritional interferences and, and grazing interferences. So that's where we teach clean keto. We teach intermittent fasting. Also, the fundamentals of health are, need to be looked at. And what, what is that sleep? It's stress. It's movement. So we look at that as well. If you don't have your sleep dialed in, if you don't have your stress, I call it masterment instead of management, it's going to be hard to heal the body, even with the right keto approach and fasting approach. So first get that fund the fundamentals down pat, which is sleep, stress, mm -hmm. movement, and then you could identify, all right, you're eating 17 times a day. Let's <laughs> cut that down. But the average American is eating 17 to 21 times per day, by the way. Uh, let's cut that down. Let's just do breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Let's focus on high quality protein and fat. So we kind of start very simple and then we, we build from there. Okay. I think that's a good, that's a good thing. So you talked about clean keto. Uh, let us know what the difference is between clean and dirty keto. And I really do want you to dive into those uh, seed oils and you said they're unstable fats. And so I wanted you to just really explain what that is and how those unhealthy fats affect us on a cellular level and create that interference. Seed oils are up there with the biggest causes of inflammation. Uh, I, I've interviewed Dr. Kate Shanahan, who, who wrote the book, Fat Burn Fix, Deep Nutrition. She, she used to be the nutritionist for the Los Angeles Lakers. And I also interviewed an MIT researcher named Brian Peskin. And I asked them both, do you think what's worse? What do you think is worse for the body? What causes more death and inflammation? Seed oils or smoking cigarettes each day. And they both believe, and I agree with them, that seed oils actually will cause more death, more inflammation, more interference than smoking cigarettes. So now that's not to give you permission to smoke cigarettes. <laughs> that's just saying the, uh, the seed oils are even worse. So seed oils are bad for us and they're called vegetable oils as well. And that is kind of a marketing term. They're more accurately should be called seed oils, industrial seed oils. They are canola oil, corn oil, cottonseed oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, uh, sunflower oil, and then rice bran oil and grapeseed oil. Dr. Kate Shanahan calls them the hateful eight. The reason they're so bad for us is because they are what's called polyunsaturated fatty acids, PUFAs. And Dr. Kate Shanahan always says PUFAs go poof, meaning they're inflammatory. PUFAs have a lot of double bonds. If you look at the chemical structure, it creates a lot of double bonds, which creates more opportunities to attract oxygen. So poly meaning many, polyunsaturated fats, many opportunities to attract oxygen. When a cell, oh, excuse me, when a fat is attracting a lot of oxygen and has a lot of opportunity to oxidize. That is similar to if I bit into an apple right now, and then you see the apple has a bite and I just leave it on the counter and I come back two hours later, it starts to turn brown. That's similar to what's happening to these fats and to your cells when you consume them. The, the body, the mitochondria within the cells cannot even really use these as an energy source. So they end up being stored in our body fat. They create inflammation and then they start blocking our communication system, meaning our hormones, nutrients, oxygen can't get into the cells as efficient as the body wants it to. So it, it creates rigid cell membranes. And the analogy I give for that, it's kind of like me putting my fingers in my ears and you're talking to me, Morgan. And I'm like, what, what are you saying? I can't hear you. So there's, there's dysfunction, right? Same thing with cellular membrane inflammation from seed oils, your hormones, your fat burning hormones can't get in. It's blocked. Uh, and so that's, you know, one of many reasons. And if you just look at the manufacturing of these oils, and uh, we were talking about this offline, mm -hmm. they use detergents, they use chemicals, they use these different processes and they use it at high heat temperatures to put it into the bottles. And then people heat it up again, and it's highly inflammatory. But guess what? They're all keto friendly. 
they're all categorized as keto friendly, but they're not health friendly. So we want to avoid those unstable fats. Instead, we want to switch over to more stable fats like saturated fats. Saturated fats contain no double bonds. They are the building blocks of your cells. In fact, part of the cell membrane is made up of saturated fat, cholesterol, and protein. So the cells love saturated fat. So saturated fat comes from coconut oil, comes from butter, beef tallow, ghee, uh, duck fat, even lard, if you could find like a high quality lard. And even monounsaturated fats only contain mono meaning one double bond. So it has a lot less opportunity to oxidize. So those are avocado oil and um, uh, 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 olive oil, excuse me. They are much, much safer than the omega-6. Omega-6 is what's considered linoleic acid. And it's estimated that about 30 to 40% of the total calories from the standard American diet come from linoleic acid. And the half-life, last point here, the last, the half-life of linoleic acid in your body fat is about two years. Meaning if you remove all omega-6 linoleic what? acid today, in about two years, half of it will remain in your body fat. Oh my goodness. That is disgusting. <laughs> Very <laughs> I love how you explain that with like the double bonds and really ex- explaining the poof is go poof. I think um, I heard you say a long time ago on one of your podcast episodes that the standard American diet is a stupid American diet. And I definitely quote that in my program because <laughs> I think it's just so spot on. And I, I heard the analogy too. I'm going to pose this question to you. Do you think that the poofas are more unhealthy than added sugar then? You know what? That's a good question because I know you interviewed Dr. Bickman and I interviewed him several times as well. Yeah. And I had this conversation with him. I asked him that same question. Do you think it's worse to consume sugar or to consume omega-6 PUFAs? And he's the insulin guy. Uh, so he, he thinks sugar is worse. And I made the counter argument respectfully because he's a, such a brilliant man that, yeah, but if you consume sugar and you're active, you could burn off that excess sugar. You could go for a workout. You could go for a walk. You could stay active. Your body can burn off excess sugar. That is a fact. But the body cannot burn off omega-6. There's nowhere for it to go. It's stored in your body fat, which sticks around a lot longer. So for that, I will say, I I believe omega-6 is worse than sugar. I would rather consume sugar personally than omega-6. I could be active, burn off the excess sugar, but I can't do anything about the omega-6. Now, that's a kind of a hypothetical question because most seed oils come packaged with in foods with sugar, right? So, you know, it's kind of hard to get one without the other. It is. And I have a couple points here that I wanted to make. Um, the Don't let me forget marketing. So if I forget to bring up the marketing of food, healthy food products, let me know. But okay. in Dr. Bickman's book, he has that great picture where he talks about fat cell um, hypertrophy um, compared to like an increase in number of fat cells. So fat cell hyperplasia. And when we have fat cells that grow in size, not number, they become more insulin resistant. And one thing that contributes to that um, are these PUFA oils combined right. with inflammation. And so that really clicked to me on, okay, so they don't raise in, in insulin and blood sugar right away, but they certainly contribute to insulin resistance over time. And speaking of that, you know, maybe something doesn't have a negative health effect right away. And so we're recording this in January. So the um, YouTube video that just came out uh, on my channel a couple days ago had five sugar free ingredients that still raise your blood sugar. And I was doing a client call right before here and uh, she's transitioning to a lower carb lifestyle. And she was like, well, what about these barbell protein bars? And I said, well, first of all, you can never pay attention to any marketing or any packaging. And she said, she spit off, you know, their whatever, any health claim they could make, you know, this is not real, but like vegan, uh, GMO free, like all these things. And I said, well, they certainly uh, capitalized on what they can market on. So let's see what they're hiding on the back. And it turns out they were hiding super lows. They were hiding acetylene potassium and they were hiding soybean oil. And I'm like, girl, these are unhealthy ingredients. So next time we purchase something, we're going to be looking at the ingredients, not just the macros. And I'm sure that your practice has I I can tell you're a fellow lifelong learner. I mean, isn't it crazy to start tracking macros 
and then continually evolve our knowledge base on, wow, that not all fat is created equally. And, you know, not all carbohydrates are created equally. So yeah, I love, I love that you teach that because you're so yeah. right. You do not want to fall for the marketing, the brilliant marketing, which they say GMO free, gluten free, whatever it is, but turn it around like Morgan just said, and look at the actual ingredients. And sucralose is another dirty keto ingredient, which is an artificial yeah. sweet. It's also famed potassium and, and soybean oil. And to your point about Bickman explaining the fat cells get bigger from vegetable oils, industrial seed oils, that's because this, the solution to pollution is dilution, meaning uh, vegetable oils are toxins. They're toxic to the body. And the body will dilute that by increasing its fat cells for those toxins to go, the, the fats to go into because the solution to pollution is dilution. So it doesn't kill you right away, but the body dilutes it, but it's slowly going to kill you. It's slowly going to create insulin resistance. It's slowly going to create membrane inflammation. So we want to make sure we're not following, uh, falling for the brilliant marketing. Instead, we're looking at each ingredient and we're even asking questions like, what is the sourcing of this grass fed way? You know, what is the sourcing of this X, Y, Z? Look at the sourcing too. That's also another thing we can do. Yeah, I think that's so important. And like you said, it might not have an immediate impact like the acetylene potassium. Right. Um, I don't know about from what you've researched, but for that video, I didn't see evidence that it immediately raised blood sugar, but it had a post oral glucose response because it changed the gut lining. And it's like, okay, well, that's still going to impact your blood sugar long term. And I did a home care eval on this guy. This is a story, then we'll go on to another one once. And he had advanced type two diabetes. He had, you know, all the things and he was wheelchair bound, but he wasn't taking any diabetic medications. And I was like, wait a second, you have diabetes on your record, but you're not on any medications you're on 25 other medications, but you're not on diabetes medications. What's going on here. And he said, you know, they started cutting off my toes and, uh, they wanted to take my legs. And I said, no. And I, and so I turned my diet around and I, you know, got off my fast acting insulin and my, my slow acting insulin. And, uh, I really, you know, started taking control of my health health. And I thought, well, wouldn't that have been beautiful if he had made that choice 20 years earlier and he wouldn't be bound to a wheelchair right now. But yeah. I went into his kitchen and I said, okay, that's wonderful. Like, let's take it to the next level. What are you drinking? You know, and he was just having so much sucralose. And I said, <laughs> putting sucralose in his coffee, sucralose in all of his drinks. And I'm like, this is the next thing to optimize. Just change it to stevia or change it to a, a more healthy uh, sweetener. So I think it's really beautiful to kind of hear that story. And I just was like, how did you do that? You know, how did you motivate yourself to change? And he's like, I was determined to keep my legs, mm -hmm. but people don't have to let it get that far, you know? Yeah, agreed. So anyways, I just wanted to share that story about he'd come so far and he still had, everyone has optimizing to go, you know, the next step for him was to change the artificial sweeteners in his drinks. So very important there. Um, now, before we get too off the topic of fats, I wanted to talk about omega-3 fatty acids specifically, because I've heard you say in the past that you actually don't recommend fish oil. Um, and I wanted to just hear more of your thoughts on that and ask what you do recommend so that people meet that uh, beautiful omega-3 fatty acid recommendation. Uh, fish oils are also a, a PUFA. Fish oils are PUFAs. And even though they're omega-3, they're an omega-3 PUFA. And the reason is... About that. What? Tell me about that. This is kind of a newer spin on it. Yeah, because they also have double bonds. In fact, they have more double bonds than omega-6 vegetable oils. Fish oil does. They contain up to five double bonds and linoleic acid has about two to three. They actually have more opportunity to oxidize. That's one problem. Another problem is that about 83% of fish oil sold is already rancid before we even purchase it, before we even bring it home with us. Let's say it's the 17%, a company that does it the right way. They have great processing and they preserve the fish oil. It's still a PUFA, but also it's very unstable. So when it enters your body, it's going to mix with your warm body temperature. That will turn it into an unstable fat. And also your stomach acids, which will also convert it to more of an unstable fat. 
And then all of a sudden your body's going to have to use antioxidants to deal with that unstable fat fish oil instead of using antioxidants for something else. So if you're taking fish oil and taking antioxidants, pretty much canceling itself out. And there's another problem with fish oil. Uh, the reason why so many people use fish oil is because they're like, I need EPA, I need DHA. You know, the, my doctor says EPA, DHA, EPA, DHA. It's true. We do need EPA and DHA, but not as much as you might think. The, the average adult brain, the brain needs the most EPA and DHA. The average adult brain requires only 7.2 milligrams of EPA and DHA every day. One capsule of fish oil on average has 1,000 milligrams of EPA and DHA. And people are not just taking one capsule of fish oil. They're taking two, three, four. They're getting this super physiological overdose which is not realistic to the way our ancestors lived, then it's, you're getting all this unstable PUFA into your body. So there's an easy fix. Uh, and by the way, I took fish oil for years and I would recommend it for years until I came across the research and I stopped. But there's a solution. You could just eat fish once a week. If you could get a high quality fish once a week, we'll cover the bases of EPA and DHA. Or you could go, which is what I do as well, and take a plant-based omega that actually could give your body the derivatives. They're called parrot essential oils. It gives your body the derivatives for your body to make its own EPA and DHA. You actually can make your own fish oil without actually eating fish or taking fish oil. So those are two better options that I recommend. I think fish oil does a lot more harm than good. And fish oil has been picked up by big pharma and it's a multi-billion dollar industry. So mm -hmm. the studies out there, on fish oil are very mixed, but there was a, a Cochrane collaboration. Cochrane does a great job at looking at the best studies on a specific topic and synthesizing whether or not this works. And they did, they did that with fish oil. They looked at all the best studies on fish oil and they came to the conclusion that it doesn't benefit you. It doesn't benefit you at all the way that we think. And I believe it actually causes more harm than it does benefiting anybody. What about, have you seen any research study comparing like the, you know how you said most of that, most of it is rancid anyways, comparing the fish oil to the plant-based ALA? No, I haven't. That would be a great study. Uh, no, I haven't seen that. But the one that I use, the plant-based ALA, um, the reason why I trust it is because it's nitrogen infused, which preserves it from going rancid. And they do, you know, third-party testing on their specific product. So you want to make sure if you're going to take a plant-based omega, they do something similar. It's not, you don't want to just go ahead and get a plant-based omega, make sure they, they process it the right way. But that, to your point, that would be a really interesting study. Mm -hmm. And I know my audience is very educated. And so, um, and my members, especially there's a little chart in the program, you know, ALA, and then I don't know, eight to eight to 15% conversion rate. What do you usually see? To eat? Yeah, it's around there, less than 10%. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, if you're taking a thousand milligrams of EPA and DHA, you know, you really, like you said, you don't need maybe as much as people assume. Uh, and so if you take enough ALA, your body, even though there's a lower conversion rate, your body can still make plenty of uh, EPA and DHA for your brain. So I'm really glad that we covered that in detail because that was something um, that we hadn't covered before, you know, and I'd been researching it on the back burner, but hadn't kind of discussed publicly, maybe why we should reconsider taking the fish oil supplement, um, just get it from natural food if you can, but if you can't, what's the better option? So especially for like someone who doesn't want to eat, the, eat fish, like a vegetarian, yeah. um, you know, that's, I always like to try to have some sort of good option for vegetarians. Um, because you don't want to just like, you're like, Oh, sorry. Like, <laughs> I don't know what to do for you. So I like to kind of gather those solutions. Um, Great. What do you think are the biggest with your experience? I know you've done so much keto coaching. What do you think are the biggest mistakes that people make when they embark on the keto diet? Well, the first one is, is looking at it as a diet. I saw that you put it in parentheses. The keto it's, diet. Yeah, it, it's, yeah it's not necessarily technically a diet. Keto, keto is a metabolic process and it's been around forever. There's nothing new about keto. It's just nuanced. It has been around since humans have existed. Every single one of our ancestors did keto. So a lot of people make the mistake of looking at it as like a fad diet or I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to do keto. But I like to reframe them and teach them, look, you don't lose weight to get healthy. You get healthy to lose weight. And ketosis could help you do that. 
but you got to do it smart. You got to do the right way. The biggest mistake is eating the vegetable oil. So we already covered that. Yeah. The second mistake is not understanding the relationship between the dietary fat you're eating and the liver and the gallbladder. Because the liver, mm -hmm. the soccer mom organ we talked about, right, Morgan? The, the soccer mom organ liver is amazing. The liver does everything for us. So many different processes, but so many people have beat up their liver throughout their life from medications, from excessive supplements, from toxins, from alcohol, processed foods. So now you're increasing your healthy fats. Let's say you're doing healthy keto, increasing, increasing your healthy fats on keto. But now the liver is just not used to producing enough quality bile, which is what breaks down the fat. So you feel awful. You get this loose stool. You feel like crap. So we want to support the liver. We want to love the liver. And how you do that is increase your bitters. Bitter for the liver. Always remember that. Bitter for the liver. So increase your bitters like arugula, dandelion greens, ginger, ginger tea, apple cider vinegar. Even coffee could act as a I mean, high quality coffee could be a bitter stimulant. Maybe even taking some bile salts, ox bile in the beginning. So that's a big mistake people make. They don't have enough bitters. They don't support their liver and they don't break down the fat and they feel awful. And also the bile is responsible for det detoxification as well. So that is another big mistake. And then the third one would be staying in ketosis for too long because the way that it works, just for those, I, I want your audience to understand how, how ketosis works in the body. It's, it's really straightforward. Out of the 70 trillion cells or so in the body, we only have two options for an energy source. Either the cells are burning sugar in the form of glucose or the cells are burning fat and producing ketones. That's it. 88.2% of Americans at least are sugar burners. Okay. I used to be a sugar burner. I used to be obese. I was a sugar burner. How do you know you're a sugar burner? You're eating every two to three hours. You don't practice intermittent fasting. If you skip a meal, you get hangry. You're eating a whole bunch of carbs. You're a sugar burner. And when your cells are stuck burning sugar, stuck burning glucose, it creates a lot of cellular smoke, cellular byproducts, toxins, because your cells produce energy the same way if I burn firewood and it created smoke, your cells do that very similar with cellular smoke, cellular byproducts. And I compare a cell burning sugar to a truck with all this smoke coming out of the exhaust pipe. The truck is not healthy for the surrounding environment. But when we teach your body to burn fat and use ketones, then it's like a Tesla, cleaner source of energy versus the truck. So how it works is you're lowering your carbs, increasing your healthy fat and protein, and your body starts mobilizing your body fat and starts breaking down body fat. And that's sent to your liver, the soccer mom organ, the liver sees all that and starts producing ketones, ketogenesis, the creation, the birth of ketones. And then ketones have the unique ability to cross the blood brain barrier and the brain could use it as an energy source. And it's great for brain fog. It's great for people who struggle with mental clarity. So the mistake people make is falling in love with keto because they feel so great and sticking with it forever for years and even several months. And the same way that our ancestors all did keto, they also flexed out when they had the opportunity. So we want more metabolic flexibility because that's one way of creating metabolic inflexibility is just being in ketosis all the time and not switching to the other pathway. Look, burning sugar all the time is bad, but burning sugar from time to time is great. We want to go back and forth. And that's the way I teach it in Keto Flex. Yep. I think that's such a common misconception. And um, it's such a pitfall, you know, because people get carb phobic after they kind of lower their carbs and they see these great results. And then they eat carbs again because they wanted some ice cream and then they got all puffy and gained two pounds the next day. And then they feel like such a, you know, they feel defeated because I've done all this hard work for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then I have one ice cream and then I gain all the way back, you know? So I think that that's why the mindset piece of weight loss and um, the behavioral coaching of habit change is so important throughout this whole health journey. Um, what have you kind of noticed aside from that, that one that you said of like wanting to, to stay in keto too long, what are some other mindset things that you've noticed in your community that kind of are currently come up that maybe get in the way of that long-term sustainable progress that we all want for our clients? It's the stinking thinking people have, 
negative thoughts and you can't heal the body if the body has hate, if you have hate in your thoughts, because you become what you think about most of the time. That's a fact. So even if you're changing your macros, doing keto, doing intermittent fasting, but you have these negative thoughts, these hateful thoughts, these resentful thoughts, this thinking, thinking, it's going to be hard to heal because it's just, it's going to create inflammation. Your thoughts can create inflammation in your body. That's a fact. Dr. Bruce Lipton has proven that thoughts are a frequency that have the ability to cross your cell membranes and communicate with your DNA to produce proteins. And that, if it's a negative thought, will produce inflammatory proteins. If it's a positive thought, it will produce anti-inflammatory proteins. The average person thinks 60,000 thoughts every single day. And 90% of those thoughts are the same thoughts from yesterday and the day before and the day before that. And they're usually negative thoughts. So we need to change that pattern. It's called the paradigm. We need to break that paradigm, bust it up and create a new paradigm, which takes time. It takes 66 days, according to the University of College London, to start forming new behavior patterns in the brain. And uh, uh, that's a big, big uh, thing in the keto space, in the health space in general, because people are not doing the inner sizing before they're doing the exercising. So I, I believe it's important to do affirmations as woo woo as people might think it is. Affirmations have changed my life to practice gratitude because what you appreciate appreciates and what you think about and what you think about you bring about. So have a gratitude practice, have an affirmation practice and start becoming really aware of the thoughts because if you're thinking is thinking your dreams are shrinking. Okay. That's a very, very important lesson that I've learned. Um, I just like, I want to cut up that entire last minute into all of those little nuggets that could just be like Instagram quote, Instagram quote. <laughs> it's true. Like, you, the, the most influential person that you're going to speak to today, Morgan, is you. The most influential person I'm going to speak to today is me. You are the most influential person you will ever speak to. So how is the conversation going? What are you saying to yourself? Are you saying you're ugly, you're stupid, you can't heal, you're never going to lose the way? Are you saying something negative? Because if you are, you're just going to get more of that. That's a universal law. You get what you feed energy to. So mm -hmm. let's flip that and feed energy to things that we want to work for us, even if it's not even done yet. Even if you haven't accomplished the goals, you believe it, before you see it. I learned that from Dr. Wayne Dyer. We don't see it to believe it. It's backwards. We believe it first and then we see it. That's the way it works. So that was Dr. Wayne Dyer. Yes. Okay. I'm going to ask you about the, was that the same person that you said for the, the, your thoughts produce proteins or was that someone else? That was uh, somebody else. That was Dr. Bruce Lipton. Okay. Well, I'm going to be sure to get those names down and, and do some more research in there. Um, I'm a huge believer of this. Um, so my whole Zibli system, the very first key is auto suggestion. And so this is how I teach it in the community. I say, so you have to figure out what your why is, and it can't just be to lose weight. It has to be very specific reasons that you want to get healthy. How does your life change? How do, how do your love, like, how do the lives of your loved ones change? Are you um, giving them more peace of mind? Are you giving you more peace of mind that you're not going to be a burden to them as you age? What increases, you know, how do you want to feel? And usually it's the stark contrast to how they feel. You know, you want to feel confident. You want to feel beautiful. You want to feel sexy. You want to feel like you want to be more social. And then you start thinking those things now. So I have this whole personal faith formula. And I said, you read that out twice a day. Your negative thoughts are kind of like, you know, a nail. And the only way you can get it out is by hammering down uh, positive thinking. What do you want to think about? And then the other way I explain it is with this personal faith formula, you're kind of creating a blueprint for a house, you know, and it's like, you would never build a house, go to a builder and be like, can you build me a house? That's like, can I lose some weight? Can I start my keto? It's like, right. you know, how many square foot do you want? How many rooms do you want? What, what color do you want the walls? And the better you can visualize the, the future that you want, the more, the more likely you're, you're going to get that future. You know, but so often when we're going through this process, I'll be like, okay, close your eyes. You're at your quote unquote goal weight. What actions are you taking consistently? And they're kind of like stumped. They're like, I'm eating healthy. Well, what does that mean? And it's like, well, you're not getting the results that you want because you're not giving your brain clear enough instructions. 
Mm-hmm. And so when you mentioned, you know, so many of our thoughts are on repeat and so many of them are negative. So these are going to be the thoughts that we're going to do on repeat. And we're going to identify those negative limiting thoughts objectively, not shaming ourselves for them because that's counterproductive. Yeah. It's like, well, what do you want to think instead? Well, you start thinking that. And I think it was so powerful for me. And I'm sure you had this realization along your journey too, that our reality today is a manifestation of our thoughts from yesterday and the day before and the day before. And it's like, if you want to lose weight up here, I love what you said. You have to exercise before you exercise. It's like, you got to lose the mental weight too. Mm -hmm. Don't you see that in your keto community? If someone does like a you know, a month long keto challenge, you know, they lose the physical weight, but if they don't address the mental weight, it comes back on. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you do that. I love the personal faith formula. I think that's brilliant. And it's true. Uh, Mental obesity. I mean, I've been there. Uh, Mm -hmm. We want a mental six pack. A mental six pack is more important than a physical six pack. And it starts with your thoughts, your words become your world. And it doesn't happen overnight. Mm-mm. But after, you know, you get very intentional and you you just are consistent with it, especially right before bed and in the morning, yeah. that's when the subconscious mind is highly impressionable. So make sure you're blocking out those two times to feed that subconscious mind the things you want to work for you. So a gratitude practice, which I call vitamin G, the strongest vitamin. Oh my in the world. gosh, you're so good. <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, gratitude and writing down your goals, doing those affirmations, doing your PFF doing that before bed, doing it in the morning. Those are the most important times to do it. Yep. And I kind of explain it like right before you go to bed, you know, your subconscious brain is like this brilliant secretary and it's finally away all of your thoughts and your feelings. And if you keep giving it something right before bed, it's going to be like, that is, that must be important. She keeps telling me that. And then when you do it right in the morning out loud, because your subconscious brain is more stimulated auditory, you know, and visually versus just reading it. It's like you put your glasses on, you know, you have your blue light blockers on. I'm not being great about that right now because I don't want the reflection, but it's kind of like you give yourself a lens through which you want to see your decisions for the day. You keep it top of mind. You don't let yourself forget. You don't let yourself get unmotivated. You know, it's like motivation is kind of stupid anyways. If you're going to use your motivation, use it to do this PFF, the personal faith formula or your gratitude you know, it takes two minutes and it's free and it's easy and it doesn't require anything. So that's how I like to, that's how I want people to use their motivation and their willpower is to embed those positive intentions in that subconscious brain that's responsible for executing that beautiful plan. That's a great analogy. The secretary, you know, put that secretary to work for you. (laughs) And you're right about motivation. There's a big difference between motivation and inspiration. As a matter of fact, I I believe motivation is actually a symptom that you're not living life according to your highest values, that you don't know, you haven't determined what your whys are. So you need something external to motivate you. Now, inspiration means you're clear on your why and nobody needs to tell you to do it. You find yourself doing it automatically. And when you're inspired, that comes from within. When you're motivated, that comes external. And external is not lasting very long. It's like, I know, I remember Zig Ziglar said, motivation is like taking a shower. We require it every single day. It's something that you have to keep getting, but inspiration, it just comes naturally. And it only comes when you understand your why you mentioned it earlier. The why is so important when the why is strong, the hows become easier because you're just inspired to act. So get clear on the why that's the first step. Yeah. I just think so many different programs out there, they start at the action phase. They start with the strategy and then they completely neglect this side. Or if they, if they talk about it, it's more superficial. It's like, no, this is the most important thing of your life. You mm-hmm. know, your why is driving every single decision, every single thought, every single action and your results. That's why right. are we not spending so much more time, you know, identifying and focusing on that? So I just, I was kind of wondering if you had any specific strategies. Um, I know, I mean, I can kind of, it, it takes one to know one, you know, someone who really studies mindset and studies psychology and studies personal growth. I know you know it. Um, So what are some things that you've done for yourself and that you coach your members on to really uh, inner size, inner size? How how do you improve your mindset? Gratitude practice, having some sort of gratitude practice. So for me, it's in the morning, I'll write down 10 to 15 things that I'm grateful for. I actually grab a pen and paper and write it. I have a notepad 
by my nightstand and I write it every morning and then I write down my goals in present tense. So mm -hmm. goals and gratitude. Uh, I also have affirmations on cards that I read first thing in the morning and I just repeat them throughout the day on, in my head. So when it comes to this practice, I started doing this practice almost six years ago, maybe seven years ago. And I, I haven't missed a day in, in those six to seven years. I actually have notepads and notepads just filled with goals and gratitude. I probably have 20 plus notepads just filled with goals and gratitude. So I do that in the morning and I do it before bed. Sometimes I, I won't write it out before bed, but I'll think it. And then sometimes I will. But in the morning, I always make sure I write it out. And something else that I do that I recommend is throughout your day, as you're going through your day, walking your dog, washing dishes, cleaning the house. Like what are the thoughts that you're thinking? Become aware of them. And mm -hmm. if it's a negative thought, well, the greatest power that we have as human beings, we could choose a better thought. And as you change your thoughts, you, you change your life. Dr. Wayne Dyer said, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And, and it creates new neural pathways in the brain. You activate different parts of the reticular activation system. So start small, little little step that you could do today and then build from there each day. You don't have to do all the things I'm saying here day one. You just start little small steps, small tweaks that lead to giant, huge peaks. Yeah, I think that's awesome. I know I've done, I've kind of spurred, uh, I don't know, done gratitude at some points. My kids are so young. We haven't had, we like get a good night of sleep maybe once a week. Um, and we used to have this beautiful practice where I'd get up, I'd read my Bible, I'd do my gratitude, I'd have my coffee. I also had oatmeal with a banana and chocolate chips. But that, <laughs> that part kind of eventually faded away. Smart. Um, you know, but it was a beautiful time in the morning to just set my intentions for the day. I miss it. When my kids start sleeping more, I'll certainly go back to that. So right now with my limited time, I just read my personal faith formula first thing in the morning with my coffee. And then just like you, sometimes I'll read it out loud at night. Sometimes I'm tired. So I'll just kind of say it in my head, but that is such a game changer. And I think that people think it's so woo woo. Like, do you get, do you get the sense that people might think that we're really woo woo talking about this stuff all the time? Yeah. But here, here's what I tell them if, if I, cause I get that a lot. Yeah, Ben, that's woo woo. There's no science to back that up. There is, I'm going to explain the science so yeah. people understand it. There's a part of the brain called the reticular activation system, RAS. How the RAS works is that whatever you feed it, you see more of in, in real life. Here's a perfect example. Let's say you, somebody listening in your, on your podcast right now, they want to buy a car and it's a red Tesla that they have fallen in love with. They want a red Tesla. So they're on the internet looking at leases versus used versus uh, renting it or, or whatever. They're looking at different options for the red Tesla and they end up going to the dealership and they end up buying the red Tesla. So excited about it. They're driving off the lot, the car lot, the car dealership, and they're driving home. And all of a sudden they see a red Tesla dart past them. And they think, oh, that's super weird. What a coincidence. I just bought one. Anyways, they think it's a coincidence and they just keep driving home. They're at a red light and they see another red Tesla right besides them. And then for weeks, they just see red Tesla's everywhere. Now what happened? Did everybody buy a red Tesla because you bought one? No, it was always there, but you now activated the reticular activation system to see it everywhere. That's the same thing with gratitude and affirmations. When you start feeding your RAS, all the things you want to work for you, now all the obstacles that you perceive as obstacles are now opportunities and you're using them as stepping stones. And now things are not challenges. They're actually opportunities for you to grow. And that's the way it works. That's the way the RAS works. It's a selective seeking organism, a part of your brain. That's, I have not researched that. I mean, I know it works because it's just so it's changed my life and my relationships so profoundly. Um, ask my husband, haha. -ha. <laughs> <laughs> We're almost, we've been married almost uh, eight years and then two wow. kids, one during COVID. Uh, I started my business when my, when my son was four months old. Wow. So he has hung in there, uh, hung in there. Are you down in Florida, by the way? I'm down in Miami Beach, Florida. Yeah. Miami. Okay. Well, fingers crossed. We're supposed to be going to Florida for vacation here next week. And, you know, it's like that is so important to just um, de-stress and unwind and connect. And you kind of mentioned that and you've alluded to it that you go for these morning walks. But I think another overlooked part of, you know, keto and intermittent fasting and getting healthy is stress management. So people, it's so interesting, you know, they get all motivated, that external motivation, 
perhaps it's a number on the scale, perhaps it's a dress that they want to fit into a wedding for a wedding. They have that external motivation and they get motivated and they're like, okay, I need to do something. And it's like, don't you think that sometimes we need to first clear some things off the schedule so that you have more time and space to do something? Because I was talking to a client and she's, you know, you know, them, the overachievers. And uh, she's like, I, I want to start getting 10,000 steps, you know, a few days a week. And I'm like, okay, well, okay, <laughs> that might be overkill, but okay. And I said, well, how are you going to do that? She's like, I'm going to have to get up at 430 in the morning to get to get those in and get ready for work. And I'm like, so you're going to stress your body by getting up at 430 to do exercise and stress your body out a little bit more to de-stress. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, we're going to find a better solution for that. Um, so what are some of your favorite like stress management solutions that you've used um, and that you coach your clients on? Obviously, the gratitude is one. Um, good sleep is one. But what are some other things that you really like to dial in for stress management? You said yeah, that's mastermind. Mastermind. And, and what you said is, is important because so many people do what you just said about that client. You know, I'm going to wake up early and I'm going to go do CrossFit or I'm going to go exercise. So they sacrifice sleep, which, as you said, is a stressor to add more stress in order to de stress or to get. It doesn't make sense. First, you got to start with the fundamental sleep. And then you could add the exercise and fit it in. It doesn't have to be CrossFit. It doesn't have to be 10,000 steps. It could just be movement throughout the day. That's it. And you used to own a cross, CrossFit gym. So I did, I'm yeah. from someone, you know, who is obviously a b big fan of resistance training. It doesn't have to be CrossFit. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Uh, and I saw a lot of people over training when I owned my CrossFit gym. I would tell them, you know, don't do the workout today. Go there and stretch. Use the phone roller. Like mm -hmm. I would see this is your sixth day in a row. Like don't do the workout today. And, you know, people just think that more and more and more is better, but it's not the case. So how do you de-stress? What are the best ways? Yeah. Any, any way that you could find... Uh, uh, an oxytocin release, mm. which oxytocin is that feel good chemical hormone that helps you feel really good and relaxed. And it, it um, counteracts cortisol, which is the stress hormone when we, we don't want too much cortisol. So how do you release oxytocin doing things that you love, right? So going down to Florida with your family, great oxytocin. Not my family, just my husband. It's, oh, just your husband. not a family trip. This Even better, family. more oxytocin, less <laughs> more stress. <laughs> <laughs> my mother-in-law watches these <laughs> <laughs> um hugging your dog hugging yeah. your husband hugging your wife watching funny movies go, i love going to dinner with friends you know friday saturday nights i've got a group go to dinner have a good time laugh laughter is terrific walking getting out in nature doing things that you enjoy and it's unique to you and, and so finding ways to release oxytocin is the overall goal for de-stressing mm -hmm. and um how often do we just do that i mean I don't know. I just went on, um, this is a random story, but a long time ago, I went on a mission trip to Russia wow. and got caught in China for five days. Uh, interestingly enough, and we got to go see the great wall of China and we got to do all of these fun things. And I kind of felt a little guilty because I'm like, aren't we supposed to be serving people in orphanages and, you know, in hospice care homes. And it was like God telling me, Morgan, I don't want you to do anything right now. I want you to be somewhere right now. And so I think when we're thinking about getting healthy, we're thinking about all of these things we want to do instead of who do we want to be and like creating the time and space and structure in our life to be the person that we want to be instead of feeling pressure to do all of these things that we feel like we have to do to get healthy. Mm -hmm. um, just great. a random thought and story. No, it's a great thought and story. Dr. Wayne Dyer said, we're not human doings. We're human beings. To your point, we're, we're beings, not doings. I know, um, we're not doing. <laughs> so um, here's your, your question. Like how often should we do that? How do you know that something needs to change? When you find yourself complaining consistently, then it's time to implement some sort of oxytocin practice. It could be a vacation. It could be some sort of like maybe you should go to a yoga class. But when you find yourself complaining consistently several days in a row, then there needs to be something implemented. That's That would be my rule of thumb to follow. Yeah, that's good. I like to just uh, viscerally feel it too. You know, you can mm -hmm. feel if you're tense. You can feel if you're anxious. Uh, my favorite thing is to uh, eat dark chocolate in the bathtub. So let's just kind of be totally honest. There you go. Oxytocin. <laughs> it's funny. My husband will go get his beer in the shower and I'll get <laughs> chocolate in the bathtub. Whatever works for you. 
that that's works great. for me. Lock yeah. the door, lock the kids out and take your bath. And that's luxury for a mom. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I know this was kind of a fun episode because we circled around keto. We circled about circled around, um, you know, unhealthy fats, uh, fle metabolic flexibility mindset. Was there anything else that you really wanted to touch on today? No, it was a great, you know, I think overall, episode where we did talk mm -hmm. about different parts. I love that we got to talk about the mindset part Thank because you. it's, I actually love speaking about that even more than keto. I, I just think it's so important. So, um, I think we covered a lot. I hope your audience enjoyed <gasps> I it. Do too. I do too. Tell them where they can get your book and where they can learn more about you. So you get my book over at ketoflexbook.com. That goes right to the Amazon page. Right now, it's a, the book's available on paperback and on Kindle. And it's soon going to be available on Audible. I'm finishing up the recording for that. And I'm really proud of the book. It's received endorsements, and it's written on the book. Endorsements from Cynthia Thurlow uh, is, all, you know, our mutual friend. Her. Yep. Yeah, Dr. Her. Jason Fung, Dr. Benjamin Bickman, Dr. Mindy Pels, Thomas DeLauer, and Dr. David Jockers, Jimmy Moore. I mean, a whole bunch of people, Megan Ramos. So I'm really proud of it. It's um, several chapters on there. There's an entire chapter on chapter 12 on how to do keto and fasting for women, cycling women, nice. postmenopausal women. So ketoflexbook.com. And then my website is benazadi.com for all of my socials and all that. Awesome. Well, I just finished an interview with Cynthia for her book. I know it's a ton of work. I mean, I, I, I don't know personally, but I can appreciate all of the work that you've not only done for your book, but leading up to the book. So congratulations on that. It's a big accomplishment. Thank you. Thank you for putting it on audiobook for busy moms like me yeah. who only have, uh, only make time, shall I say, to read while I'm driving when I'm <laughs> Yes. I'm a big audible guy too. I know Cynthia's book will be on audible as well. She's reading it too. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. And we'll talk again soon. Thank you for the awesome conversation, Morgan. Yeah. Bye.